I think where the, the story goes, you know, the story goes, if you know what I mean. I mean, this is... Uh, this
morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good. Awesome. Hey, if, if this is your first time here, I just want to let you know that, man, I'm so glad you're here. My name is Carson Smith. I'm the student pastor here at Grace. Or if this isn't your first time and you've been coming for forever, um, everywhere in between, glad you're here. Um, I'm glad you're visiting with us. If this is your first time, I would, we would love to connect with you, and you can do that just by stopping in our guest services area right after the service. Um, get connected with those guys. They would love to see you, love to hear from you, um, love to, to answer whatever questions you might have um, about grace and, and, and how we can serve you and how you can get connected in serving and, and all that good stuff. Um, but I just have a couple of announcements for us, and, and we'll jump into worship. Um, first announcement is, is one that's near and dear to my heart, and that's Breathe Weekend for Student Ministry is right around the corner. Literally, it is Friday, so just a few days away. Um, and Breathe Weekend is always a, just an awesome time for our student ministry where we have students who, who don't come to our church that, that attend and, and realize, man, I need to get connected with the church. And there are students who they haven't been in a long time and they're, and they're um, just realizing their need for the Lord. And you just see all these awesome things happening. Um, and we cannot do Breathe Weekend without you. And there is just, just one ask I have of you. If, if you, because um, we have a, a big need, we have an eighth grade boys um, Gap. We need a, a host home for the eighth grade boys. And I and I told um, Joe in the back that I might sit here and, and cry and please, 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 and just try to shed a tear. But if you if you have a home and you would be willing to host eighth grade boys, we need a place for our eighth grade boys to stay. They're an awesome group of guys. Um, I don't say that as a joke. And when you hear eighth grade guys, you're like, what well, awesome group of guys? They're 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 really an awesome group of kids. Um, I love those guys. So if you were willing to open up your home, that would be awesome. We need that. That's our, our really our last gap that we need filled. So if you could fill that gap, that would be awesome. Um, but but moving on from from Breathe Weekend Student Ministry. Um, DOK is hosting their, their annual daddy-daughter dance, and that will be on February 9th from 6.30 to 8.30. That's an op awesome opportunity for you dads to, to just um, take your daughter out on just a, a, a little date and, and set an example for her of, of what it looks like for a, a man to love her and to take care of her and to prioritize her. So make sure you do that. That's February 9th, and that's open for, for all ages, all dads and, and daughters. Um, we also have on February 11th our biannual congregational meeting just to update you on things like elders and financial reports and everything like that. Um, that'll be at the Lavernia campus right after second service. So make sure you um, just have time for that. And, and, and lastly, um, if, if you consider Grace your church home, um, we just ask that you would consider, pray about um, giving, and you can do that in a multiple different ways. We don't pass an offering plate here, but we have boxes in the back that you can um, fill an envelope and, and place your money in, in those or fill out a form online, or you can create an account um, called Your Change, and that just rounds up your spare change, and you can give that way as well. It's a great first step in giving. Um, but that's all the announcements I have for you. So if you would um, join me in prayer, and we'll get started in worship. Heavenly Father, God, we, we thank you and we praise you that you are a God who meets us um, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of, of everything that, that goes on in life. God, you are here and you are near to us. So God, I pray that, that this time that we would be um, just filled with your spirit, God, that we would feel your presence in this place, that we would um, sing your praises with everything that we have within us, God, knowing that... Um, that we're created to, to bring you glory. We are created for, for um, community with you, to walk with you, God. So help us with all that we are and all that we have, um, sing your praises. And so God, just help us to, to let, lay down our, our guard, uh, put down the things that are so easily distracting to us, God, the, the, the fears, the worries, the anxieties of, uh, of life, uh, the things that can distract us, the, um, just the hard things that we're dealing with, God. Help us to lay those all down. And just put them at your feet and worship you with, with everything that we have because you are worthy of all of our praise and all of our adoration. So God, we just pray that you would be glorified in this service. In Jesus' name I pray. We're excited to worship with you. Please stand. We get to worship the God of the ages, the God of creation, and roar like an army of angels. Okay. 
1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So before we move on, what I want us to do this morning is begin to shift our minds and shift our focus onto what he's called us to remember. That we're here because Jesus willingly and freely gave his body and willingly shed his blood so that we could receive salvation and be drawn back into a relationship with him. And so as we move on, I want us to, we're gonna partake of the Lord's Supper together. And so as you get the elements, as you eat the bread, as you drink the cup, think of what Jesus has done for you and how far he's brought you. So let me pray, and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Dear Father God, we just thank you. God, that oh, though we did not deserve a thing, you willingly went to the cross, gave your body, and shed your blood so that we could come back into right relationship with you so that we could be reconciled with you. Father, thank you that you loved us enough to do what we could not. So Father, let us eat and drink and remember who you are and what you've done. We pray that in your name. Amen.
Good morning, Grace. We have an amazing treat for you today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Claude Hungerford. I'm the missional impact pastor. That's a fancy title for the missions pastor. And uh, we just, uh, in part of doing our missions, we've gone to England and many times over the last years. And every once in a while, we pick up a stranger. <laughs> And so this is my good friend, Mark Green. We've known each other now for about eight years. And he's the former executive director of the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. He currently is in a position as the mission champion for the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. And we just had a summit this past weekend. <clears throat> and he taught us how in the ordinary day-to-day -day connections that we have with people and how to actually listen to the Lord to be able to speak and be able to do some of the little things to be able to make connections. And so his organization in uh, London is the, in my opinion, and many others, the leading organization globally and how to equip people and churches to be able to do this. So, Mark, thank you so much for coming and uh, putting up with us and our American humor. And we served him a proper English breakfast yesterday of baked beans and sliced tomatoes and, well, what we call crumpets here in the United States. So, thank you, Mark, so much. Thank you. And, uh, let's just pray for him and uh, for the Lord's message. Father, thank you so much for our brother, Mark and uh, just the unique things that you've taught him and give us ears to hear. Thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, muy buenos días, caballeros y caballeras. Hoy vamos a hablar en español. Eso es. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it was about 15 months ago that you that uh, you gave me my first chance. It's always great to give, be given a second opportunity, a second chance at getting it right. I love being in Texas. I mean, I don't just say that. There's two places I most love being in the US, uh, Texas, this state. I come here, you know, hopefully about once every year or two to get my injection of what I call testosterone. <laughs> And uh, I just absolutely love it. It was a great um, privilege um, uh, to be here with everybody yesterday. Um, in a moment, I'm going to do a little bit more introduction. In a moment, just to tell you where we're going, I'm going to look at one of the most extraordinary periods in the life of the Apostle Paul, uh, his voyage to Malta, and we're going to see what we can learn about the scope of our ministry um, in the ordinary places we find ourselves day by day by day out in God's world, in the places where you meet um, the people you normally meet, whether that's at school or at uh, or at college, or in the workplace, or at the school gate, or wherever it might be. Um, yesterday at the conference, uh, we were thinking about how we can have, um, you know, learn more about the people. How, you know, the kind of questions that you can ask people that help you understand where they're at. One of them is, you know, what's your favorite film? That's a, often, or movie, if that's the better translation. Um, you know, what's your favorite movie? You often learn a lot about people from what they, their favorite movies or their favorite books. And then, of course, then sometimes we talk about um, what's your favorite Christmas film? And I don't know what your favorite Christmas film, there's a lot. And it's my privilege today, it's my privilege today, uh, to be the first person to announce to you. This is a global first announcement. No one has heard this in the world yet. To announce to you um, the upcoming new Christmas film for next year, which is... Can we have the slide, please? Santa Claude's Revenge. <laughs> Starring Anthony Hopkins playing Claude Hungerford. And I hope you're going to look forward to that. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic thing. I used to work in advertising. Um, some of you know. I'm just going to do, some of you may remember that. So you can trust every word you hear from me, including the launch of Santa Claus Revenge. That's obviously. And um, you can trust every picture you see. I spent uh, around 10 years working in advertising. And uh, I don't know how you feel about your job, but I loved it. I loved it. Uh, mainly in New York, actually, in Madison Avenue. I love the people, the pace, the creativity, and the lunches were marvellous. And as you heard, I worked for the London Institute. And Retta, I'm going to skip a few slides uh, to put people out of their misery at this point. And um, just so you know, and skip to the passage now. 
I saw God do amazing things in that place. And here we have an extraordinary passage. Um, it's recorded for us in Luke's history of the early church in the book of Acts. And I wonder what God might be saying uh, to you through this. Um, the story so far is Paul is a, a convert, a Jewish convert to Christ. He's on his way to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. And actually, he's keen to get there. He wants to take the gospel to Rome. He's not intimidated by this. He wants to stand before Caesar and have an opportunity to talk about Jesus to him. And he's been escorted by a centurion called Julius, who has treated him really well. Paul's got favor with him. He's allowed him to visit friends on the journey. And we're going to pick this, um, this up at uh, verse 9. I'm going to read this. It's quite long. It's quite an adventurous passage. So strap yourselves in for this. Uh, picking up at verse 9. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage we will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, the harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear. And thus, they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they'd been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that will be, it will be exactly as I, as I have been told. But we must run aground again on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little further on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As dawn was about to, sorry, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of, head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they'd eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. 
So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Well, this is a rich, uh, rich passage, and there are parallels, so perhaps you pick them up in, in the text as we were reading, that we might explore between Paul and Jonah, two men in boats in a storm in the Mediterranean, both charged with communicating the good news about Jesus to the capital city of the dominant empire of the time. And there are parallels we might explore between Paul in a boat in a storm and the disciples of Jesus in a boat in a storm on Lake Galilee. And it's right to make those parallels. But with narratives, with stories like this, the first thing we're meant to do is to look really carefully at what's going on in the story itself before we make connections with the wider book or make connection with the Bible as a whole and the revelation of God in Christ. And so here, Luke, as you may have noticed, gives us a tremendous amount of maritime detail, a lot of detail about this voyage. In fact, if you look at the book of Acts, there's no other voyage, no other journey that Paul takes where we've got nearly as much detail. So what is going on? Why has the Holy Spirit given us all this detail? So for today, I want to focus on what can we learn from looking at this text about the scope of our, your ministry in the places you find yourself, in a time of pressure. This is obviously a time of pressure for them. And what can we learn about the scope of God's support for us in the storms that we face? Now, as you know, in, in the book of Acts, we usually encounter Paul in short encounters with people. He's in the marketplace or he's speaking on Mars Hill to a group of people. But imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment that you are Paul. Uh, in a boat with 273 people who don't know Jesus, sailors, soldiers, other prisoners, no doubt, and you're there for months, just you and Luke and Aristarchus, three out of 276. That's less than one, just over 1% of the population. You are a minority, as perhaps you are, in, in your workplace. Um, or you, perhaps you're a minority in, in your school place, or you're a minority in a club, or you're a minority in your street, and you're there for a prolonged period of time. So imagine you're Paul, and you do build a good relationship with the centurion, the Roman centurion, Julius. And then one day you're praying, and God gives you a vital message for the senior management team, if you like, the centurion, the pilot, and the owner of the boat. You're a prisoner, and you have already been in three shipwrecks. <laughs> Paul is a tough guy. Um, but, uh, and you have, therefore, having been in three shipwrecks, you have very good reason to be slightly wary of sea travel. Uh, you, but by trade, you're an itinerant teacher and a maker of tents out of goatskin. That's basically what he did. But you find yourself convinced that the action that the professional sailors are preparing, proposing to take will lead to catastrophe. Now, you're not a professional, you're not a sea captain, so why would you speak? But you know that lives are at stake, so you do speak up. And, and by speaking up in this context, you are challenging three types of power. You're challenging the centurion, which is the power of the state, political power. And there are times when, when Christians need to challenge political power. And then there's the pilot, the, the power of expertise, if you like. Here's a senior consultant, they ought to know. And then there's the owner, the power of money, the power of ownership. And they all ignore your advice, as often happens, doesn't it? In all kinds of contexts. Wisdom from above is not always accepted. We're not in control, are we? Others make decisions, and sometimes we can see this is not going to turn out well. It's not going to turn out well. 
Now, in this instance, it is very clear that Paul has been given an insight from God, an insight into the future. The experts may well recognize that it is a risk to carry on with the voyage, but they don't think it's going to end in disaster. They think it's a commercial risk worth taking, but Paul is certain. Now, here the word of God comes to Paul in a clearly non-religious context. It doesn't come to him in a home group or a church sanctuary or in a discipleship group. It comes out in the world. And it's first and foremost, if you like, a message for the non-believers. Paul makes his view clear. But notice when Paul makes that view clear, he doesn't use any religious language. He doesn't say, God says. Now, at this stage... Julius, the pilot, the soldiers, the crew, obviously know that Paul is a follower of the way, that he is a follower of Jesus. That's why he's under arrest. But Paul teaches us that when we're conveying a message of wisdom to people, we don't always have to say, the Lord says. We don't always have to use religious language to do it. So here is this wisdom from above for the benefit of the whole crew. And why, why, why would I say that? Well, God does not need a boat to get Paul to Rome. He's done it before. God can whistle up a whale from the Atlantic and say, swallow Paul, dump him on the beach just outside, you know, on the mouth of the Tiber. No problem. But God is concerned for Paul's companions and God offers information that will limit the commercial impact on the owner to the Lord's glory. So what's going on here is that the owner has an opportunity. You may lose your ship if you stay uh, in a harbor that's not suitable over the winter, but you won't lose the tackle, you won't lose the cargo, and you won't lose the people. So here we see, as always, that God does care about the physical and material well-being of, of, of people, of the people that perhaps you serve, of the people perhaps that you work with. And it's always been so. Now, this is a spectacular story. So I'm going to tell you a spectacular story of God's intervention in a commercial context. It's a friend of mine called Colin Draper, and he was a production manager in a factory, a plastic extrusion molding factory. Don't really know what that is. But that is what it was, a plastic extrusion molding factory, and they had no orders. I wonder if any of you have been in a situation, if you run a small business or you're working for somebody, and there is nothing coming in. It's pretty frightening. And he's not the owner, he's, he's a production manager, and the workshops are quiet. So one day, he goes into the workshop, there are 12 workbenches there, and uh, the men, the craftsmen, are just standing around because there are no orders, nothing to do. And he pulls up a chair, and he puts the chair down by the first bench, and he puts his hand on the bench, and he prays that the bench would get busy. It's a pretty bold thing to do, isn't it? You have to work your way up to that kind of faith. And then he goes to the second bench, takes the chair with him, puts his hand on it and prays for it. And then the third and so on, all 12. That's what he does, day one. And he does it six days in a row. Extraordinary, really. And on the seventh day, the factory burned down. Just kidding. <laughs> Well, they could have got the insurance, couldn't they? <laughs> On the seventh day, they got 72 orders. It was the biggest number of orders they'd ever had on a single day in the entire history of that business. The Lord responds in an extraordinary way. He obviously encouraged that man, gave him the faith to pray that, the certainty that it would happen. And we see this concern for our physical environment, our emotional and mental well-being, all through the Bible. In Genesis chapter 12, God, God says to Abraham that through Abraham, through the people of God, and we are the heirs of Abraham in that sense, all nations will be blessed. That's what we're meant to do. And blessing is never understood merely in what you might call spiritual terms. It encompasses every aspect of human life. Food, family, friends, finance. We see the same in Jeremiah. God commands his people in exile to do what? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Seek 
the peace and prosperity of Lavernia. Seek the peace and prosperity as you do, as you do in so many ways. Seek the peace and prosperity of San Antonio, the wholeness of it, the spiritual welfare of the city, the political, physical, mental, emotional, relational, ecological, economic welfare of the city, of the town or the office or the ward or the lecture room or the gym or the hairdressing salon you go to. But back to Paul. Paul's job, our job, is to speak up for the welfare of other people, but he does not win the argument. He doesn't win the argument. Sometimes our job is to speak up for the benefit of others, and we may not win the argument. You may believe the policy is wrong, the protocol misguided, the praxis dangerous, but it may not change. Not many of us are in charge, but speaking out may still be the right thing to do and important for the longer term, as it is here. And so you set sail in your pool and nobody's listened to you. So what's now the scope of your ministry? You know this boat is going down. That's what you know. So this storm comes and it rages for days and the crew and the professionals do what they do. They follow best practice. And actually, just as a matter of interest, this, this passage is studied by ancient historians because it's actually one of the clearest records of, of what sailors did at that time under those conditions. And what do you do, the non-sailor? Well, in the midst of this terrible storm with the boat heaving and the waves crashing and the wind blowing and the sun blotted out from the sky and your body been lurched from side to side and your stomach in your skull, do you have any space in your heart for anybody else? Well, we're always on mission, aren't we? We're always on mission somehow. I remember one, uh, one woman, about 60 as it happened, and she'd been suffering from early uh, onset um, problem with her bones, arthritis, from the age of 30. What, not a hugely confident woman, if you like, and she didn't feel like she had a, a ministry, a place, we often call it a front line, a place where she could engage with people who didn't know Jesus. I don't really have one, but she loves the church, did lots of stuff in the church. And then one day she went through some stuff that we, we gave her and she suddenly realized she had a front line. And what it was, was the hydrotherapy pool that she got into, the hydrotherapy class she went to once a week. And she suddenly realized nobody else in the church got to go in that pool with the other people. And the group, that group then became her ministry. So suddenly it becomes the secret pastor, if you like, to that group. She starts praying for them. She starts organizing lifts for them, calling them up if they don't turn up, making sure they're okay, and so on and so forth. A friend of mine, the guy who discipled me, told me he heard that story, and then when his wife was in hospital waiting for five months for a heart operation, and he was going in um, every day for three hours between two and five, that's when they were allowed to visit. He heard that story and realized, that's now my ministry people around there that's our ministry now no one would wish any of those things on anybody would they but actually the Lord uses us and can work through us wherever we are and what we see here is that Paul he prays for people's mortal lives that they wouldn't die not just their eternal lives he intercedes if you like for all of the thing holistically he encourages them emotionally he says, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Now, I don't know how you would feel if you told people, we're going to go down, this boat is going down, and in fact, uh, you didn't listen to me. You didn't listen to me. You idiots, you didn't listen to me. Now nah, nah, it's all going to happen and it's all your fault. I don't think that's why he's saying it. I don't think he reminds them that they ignored his advice before to make them feel guilty, but to strengthen their confidence in what he is now saying. That's why sometimes we have to speak up early, even if we think we're not going to be listened to. Because then when it does happen, we have credibility. I was right before, so you can trust me now. God spoke before and he's spoken again. So he witnesses clearly. He says, last night, an angel of the Lord to whom I belong. 
Now notice that in this, this verse, Paul, the angel tells Paul that God has given him the lives of all who sail with you. So it's obvious that Paul has been praying for the people in his boat. He's not like Jonah, who couldn't be bothered to pray for the sailors in his boat. He's praying for everyone. He's doing what he can in that situation. Uh, Vicky, um, this woman I met, she's a respiratory physiotherapist. Um, and she was in the intensive care unit during the pandemic. And it was overflowing in the UK with patients. And she's standing there in her protective uh, equipment, holding a young, young man's hand. And the oxygen blowers are on full blast. And it's very, very noisy. Some of you are familiar with this. And she's silently praying that God would heal this young man and that he would save his soul. And it's not the first time that she would pray those prayers. And it wouldn't be the last time that she would pray those prayers. And not everybody got better. And you often didn't know because people got moved and um, shifts changed and so on. Anyway, a few weeks later, a friend uh, asked her if she had treated this man. And Vicky said, as a good professional, I am not at liberty to disclose that information. Well, her friend said, he got better and he's become a Christian. Now, not everybody got better, not everybody became a Christian. But if you take Vicky out of that intensive care unit, maybe that man would have died apart from God. Take Paul and his companions off the boat and maybe 273 people die. Take the Christian, take you out of your context, take you out of your workplace, take you out of your street, take you out of your school, and things are not the same. Paul was in a very tough place, and he was also exactly where he was meant to be. Some of you were in very tough places, and perhaps you are also meant to be there. We don't always choose our circumstances, but we can choose under God to see what he wants us to do in them and involve him there. We seek the shalom of the places God puts us. So Paul brings encouragement, but interesting, he still doesn't name Jesus. He doesn't name the particular God he follows and serves. But he does make it clear that this is the God who is guaranteeing his safety. So what is Paul doing here? He is simply bearing witness of God's action in his life, of what he has experienced about Jesus. Does he lay out the whole gospel in it, all its fullness at this point? Well, apparently not. But might all those people wonder, is this God real? Might they come to Paul and ask him about it during the voyage? Or might they wait till they see if they survive? If they survive, well, then this God is reliable. Then maybe I will follow him. We actually don't know. But Paul is simply bearing witness, sharing what this good news means to him at, on that day, to him. How did you put up with that bad-tempered boss? Well, I prayed and a group of people prayed. It was really difficult. How did you get that job done on time? Sometimes, and sometimes people see things in us that we don't see in ourselves. Talking about Vicky again, the same woman, the same physiotherapist. She'd been doing 12-hour shifts uh, for weeks, uh, not getting a break, not getting much to eat or drink, because if you left the intensive care unit, you had to take off your protective equipment and you couldn't use it again. And there wasn't much of it. So lots of these professionals just toughed it out for 12 hours. And the noise of the machines, hugely loud, and so on and so forth. And uh, it was relentless, it was exhausting. And at team meetings, she was transparent about it, and she'd share how hard it had been for her. And then one day, a colleague said to her, you know, Vicky, you're so inspiring. And Vicky's going, uh, as John McEnroe used to say, for those of you who remember him, you cannot be serious. <laughs> You cannot be serious. I, she said, I, she was completely, as we say in English, flabbergasted. I don't know if you have that phrase. Uh, she'd been in tears pretty much every day. But somehow she had been inspiring. How did that work? Well, it certainly wasn't about putting on a brave face. But there was something about her. There was something underneath. There was something deeper. There was a joy. There was a deeper sense of peace underneath all of that. That actually 
people could detect, even though they too were exhausted. And I asked her, how did, you know, what do you think it was? And uh, she said, well, I, I couldn't during that time spend very much time with the Lord. I was so exhausted. I'd come home, I'd eat, I'd go to sleep, I'd get up and get on with it. But she said every day she'd pray, Lord, give me what I need for this day. And uh, during the first wave, every day she'd listen to a particular worship song on her way to work. Here it is. Yet not I, but through Christ in me by a group called City of Light. This is some of the words. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, by your side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. And that's what happened to her. Christ lives in us. And as we rely on him, he shines through our weakness, through our distress. And God had done something in Vicky that made others see her as an inspiration. The reality is the more you involve God in your situations, the richer our testimony, our witness about him. So Paul encourages emotionally, he witnesses clearly, he strengthens them physically by encouraging them to eat, something they hadn't done for days. Take some food. Well, of course, we, we care for people's physical well-being. Of course, you know that. But in lots of normal situations, it may not be so obvious. You know, the colleague that you have you noticed they haven't been able to get away from the reception desk for four hours get a cup of coffee the beleaguered mum at the school gate the carer unseen at home day on day or maybe a fellow student who finds themselves with a paper with, of six thousand words left to right on the influence of jean paul sartre's philosophy on the music of harry styles and it has to be emailed to the lecturer by 10 a.m tomorrow can I get you a sandwich, a coffee, a cold towel, a Coke, eight gallons of Red Bull, 12 bags of Bucky's Beaver Nuggets? <laughs> well, I was given a bag when I arrived, actually, to try to keep me going after the jet lag. A whole big bag of nuggets and cherry sours and candy belts, enough sugar to keep me going for three years, I think. Very generous. Anyway, so here is Paul caring for the heart, the mind, the body, and the spirit. And then Paul does something, well, we might seem odd in our politically correct, our woke times. He prays in public. He says grace in public. A few years ago, my wife, who works for, for our health service, was working in hospital theaters. And on the Sunday before her shift on Monday, she got this strong intimation from God that something bad was going to happen the next day. So she prayed about being ready. And I prayed with her too. And on the following morning, she went into work. And then the theater team she worked with, an hour in, were called into to the staff room to discover that one of her colleagues, six-year-old son, had fallen out of a first floor window and had died. Everyone was devastated. And the person who delivered the news said something like, um, and do pray for her. Now that, in our context, is a pretty startling thing to do, to say that in a public, public service uh, context. But my wife had been prepared by the Lord, and she just said, let's do it now. And right there and then, in that public space, in a staff room with a mixture of Christians and people of other faiths, Muslims and Hindus, and probably agnostics and atheists, at that moment, she took a stand to say that in this unimaginable pain, really, in this bewildering situation, there is a God who cares and we can share this with him. In this situation where all the skills of the medical professionals have done what they can, and in this situation it was not enough, there's a place to go. No one came up afterwards and complained. But Paul is not just giving thanks here, is he? He is modeling his faith in God's rescue. He's saying, I am calm enough to eat. I believe it's worth eating because I'm going to be alive tomorrow. And so when he persuades them to eat, when they actually eat, what's going on? They're doing something that at some level is a step of faith. I trust enough, at least in Paul's words, to eat because maybe I'm not going to die. Paul invites them to live in line with his faith. 
to believe a little, to look to God, however thin their faith, however vague their grasp of who this God is. But uh, there's something important about the, word that Luke, the words that Luke uses here. It's particularly appropriate on a day when we've just shared bread and wine. These are exactly the same words that Luke uses to describe Jesus breaking bread at the Last Supper and the same words he uses to describe Jesus breaking bread on the Emmaus Road. He took some bread and gave thanks, then he broke. He took some bread, gave thanks. He took some bread, gave thanks. What is Paul doing in this public space? Whether they know it or not, he is feeding on Christ. How do we get through? We feed on Christ. And finally, Paul protects them practically. When the crew try to leave the ship, he gives the centurion a piece of advice, which this time the centurion accepts. Stop the sailors abandoning the ship. Before it was ignored, but now Paul has credibility. He gets a hearing. So yes, Paul is under this life-threatening pressure, but even under immense pressure, he doesn't lose sight of the mission he's been called to. And I wonder whether we all have such a big, multi-dimensional vision for the missional impact that we could make in the boats that we're in, in the boat that you're in, in good times as well as bad times. Seeking the best for the people we meet and the organizations we might be involved in. Witnessing clearly and taking prayerful, practical initiatives for the physical, emotional, spiritual welfare of those around us. Is this the kind of vision that we are encouraging one another in? Goodness, there you are. What a privilege to be there. Look around with the eyes of God on the people there and the challenges there. What does he want you to do? And of course, the wonderful thing is we do not go alone. This passage doesn't just give us a picture, if you like, of the scope of our ministry, what it might look like. It gives us an insight into the faithfulness of the God who sends us. This God sends his people, sends all of us with purpose. He grants Paul favor with non-believers to ask for favor. He gives wisdom from above when that's what you need. We need wisdom from above. He communicates whatever the barriers, however dark the day. He sends an angel. That's how important it is for God to communicate to Paul in this situation. He responds in prayer, making it clear what he's going to do. He strengthens his people by word and his presence. He keeps his promises. Not one person is lost. And he fulfills his purposes. The gospel will be heard in Rome as God intended. This is our Lord. This is your Lord. This is our Lord, the God of Paul and Lydia and Mary and Martha, of Vicky and my wife Katrina. And by astounding grace, your God and mine, Emmanuel, the Lord with us in all. I wonder what needs changing where you are. What would make it more like a kingdom place? Whose salvation might, might you specifically pray for? What character quality do you really need help with right now? Let's pray. Lord, in the places where you've put me this day, this week, this month, this year, with the support of my brothers and sisters in Christ, help me to model your character, to make good work in your, in your power, to minister grace and love to those around us, to mold the culture, to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice and a messenger of the gospel. For the shalom, the peace of the towns we serve, and for the healing of this nation and for the blessing of salvation of many. To the praise of your mighty name and for your glory. And the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen.
I'm so glad you guys joined us today, man. That was an awesome service. Um, if you're ready to say your next yes to Jesus, whether that's um, coming to a relationship with him and you want to know more about that or you want to join a group or you want to start serving or giving um, here at Grace, um, if you just if you go into the lobby um, and, and head to the Next Steps area, there will be people out there who would love to talk with you. Um, if you need prayer, um, our elders and their wives will be under the, the crosses here, and they would love to pray with you as well. Um, but again, thank you so much for being here this morning. I pray that just the Lord would, would bless you as you go, but I'm going to pray for us, and, and we'll go from here. Heavenly Father, God, I just, um, Lord, just thank you that you are a God who, who keeps his promises, who communicates with us, God, that, that um, never forgets us. You're always there with us. You walk with us and prepare us through seasons of life um, and an opportunity that, that we would have to, to share the gospel with someone, to pray for people. God, I pray that you would just challenge us with that, that you would um, um, equip us as we go and fill us with your spirit and help us to go from here and, and, and pour out into others. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you love us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.